Good morning and thank you for coming to our talk this morning on dry eye diagnosis with the Keratograph 5M. I'm Trisha Diage and I'm currently working as a clinical consultant for Oculus. As I mentioned, um, we're here to talk about the Keratograph 5 and specifically looking at dry eye diagnosis. Well, when I think about ophthalmology today, I think of a very, very all-inclusive care for patients. If you look around us just at this convention meeting today, there's so much new technology. There's always something being developed on the market and making this a very interesting field to work in. However, when we think about dry eye disease and dry eye diagnosis and everyday practices, it's very often overlooked and underdiagnosed and untreated. If you look in some of the studies, when you read about some of the people working with this condition, they mention the high prevalence, a lot of causes for this disease, problem to correctly diagnose, and also which treatment to use for which type of condition as some of the reasons why this condition might be overlooked and untreated. I've did a little bit of a reading up before I, uh, when I prepared for this talk, and apart from the common figure of 100 million people more or less suffering globally with this disease. It's interesting to look at the prevalence here in Asia of dry eye disease. In some countries like Taiwan and Korea, it's been reported that up to 30% of the population, the aging population, will be suffering with this disease. But for me, a very interesting number is this, which I read in the study called the burden of dry eye disease that some doctors estimate that even up to 60% of your patients in daily practice can be a sufferer from dry eye disease, but they're not always tested or diagnosed. What are some of the causes? I think many of you know that things like computer work, aging, air conditioners, all of these contribute to the occurrence of dry eye disease. The introduction of smartphones and tablets in the market also is causing that not only the aging population, but also the younger people, even kids, are starting to struggle with dry eye disease. Once again, we have to include this in our um, screening process and we have to look at all of these people and treat them for this disease. In 2007, and many of you here today have seen this um, picture, the dry eye workshop came together and they did a definition, they defined dry eye disease and separately distinguishing the two dis, um, groups calling uh, being aqueous deficient and evaporative dry eye. However, the same group of people meet, met last year in 2017 and they re-evaluated the definition and they came up with this new definition of dry eye disease which specifically say we have to not only look at it as these two distinct groups, but we have to consider that the occurrence of both of these two groups simultaneously happens quite often. And this is something that we have to look at when we are diagnosing and treating dry eye disease. Why is dry eye disease screening important for you in your de uh, daily practice? Some of the symptoms that patients report when they suffer from severe dry eyes is not only just pain and discomfort, it also influences their clarity of vision. It influences their performance at work because their discomfort towards the end of the day make it difficult for them to concentrate. And that's why improving these symptoms can prove life-changing for a lot of people suffering with dry eye disease. But here in this ophthalmology meeting today as well, I know it's important to look at not only the symptom improvement, but the effect that dry eye disease can have on things like cataract surgery. It's a direct result of laser procedures. And if not treated and not diagnosed prior to your surgeries or your treatments, you will have problems with your cataract IOL implants because your measurements of your biometry can be influenced. The calculation of the IOL powers can be influenced. So all in all, it's very important to look a dry eye disease and to be able to diagnose it prior to these treatments. This is just a general interesting statistical uh, numbers that I found also in some studies. What is the prevalence of dry eye disease and some of these procedures that we perform daily in clinics. So if you look at all these facts, it becomes clear that a comprehensive dry eye screening process 
should be part of any ophthalmology or optometry practice, quite frankly. Now let's look at the history or let's look at the way that dry eye disease is usually treated in many practices today. Patients come in, they complain of a dry eye, and then what people do is they listen to their symptoms and traditionally fluorescein breakup time and also a little bit of a Schirmer dry eye test is used to diagnose the disease. First of all, both of these tests are fairly invasive and can, invasive and can influence the production of the tears. Also, it's uncomfortable for the patient and the Schirmer test alone takes up to five minutes to complete. So it's also a little bit of time consuming in the practices. So what are we now doing? With the development of any new device or any new procedures on the market, we have to consider a few things. We have to consider what is important for the doctor, but also what is important for the patient. And if we look at the requirements of these two groups separately, the doctor wants to have tests that save them time, that doesn't take too long. It needs to be reproducible. It shouldn't be too invasive specifically when it comes to dry eye diagnosis. And obviously in the end of the day, it needs to have a return on investment because there is money that's being spent on these devices. For the patient on the other hand, they want to have value for their money. They want to have correct diagnosis. They want to have comfort when it comes to their um, procedures. And then in this era where we're living, where people can easily go on Google and search, they want to be educated about their condition. The development of dry eye screening with the Keratograph 5M has taken all of these factors into consideration and let's look at how this is done. As I mentioned before in the set, um, we have one device, one report, one screening way to look at dry eye disease. What they've done with the keratograph, they've changed the lightning in the system and also changed the magnification. And this enabled the device to actually start looking and monitor and doing non-invasive dry eye disease. Today, I'm introducing the new Genvis Pro Dry Eye Port. Some of you have been working with the keratograph, may be used and familiar with the Genvis Classic report. We are now, now launching a new report called the Genvis Pro Report. And I will go through the different things that's being evaluated with this report, but just for now, this is after you've done the screening process, the report that you will see and also your patient receive. Very nice is all the results of all the different procedures is color coded as results. It's easy to understand for the patients, but also furthermore, we include the recommendations for their treatment plan. This will increase their compliance because they have something visually to look at. And lastly, we also have an explanation of all the procedures that was done so that they actually understand what happened to their eyes. And I also would just like to mention, if you have this device, you can include your practice logo here at the top. And that's obviously a good word of mouth and advertising for your clinic. I mentioned earlier the 2007 dues meeting, and this was the new definition as which they define dry eye disease. Some of the words that we look, have to look at is obviously the tear film is being affected, but also ocular symptoms, which includes the conjunctiva, the cornea, and the surrounding eyelids. So when we are looking and when we are treating or diagnosing dry eye, we have to not only look at the eye, the tear film, but we also have to look at the adjacent um, features around the eye, being the cornea, the conjunctiva, but also the appearance of the lids and the eyelashes. And this is what we have done and what has been included in the new Genvis Pro dry eye report. After you've completed screening, and we'll go through the screening processes now, you will receive this assessment screen, which makes it easy to assess all of these different um, fields. And you are getting a comprehensive analysis of the whole area of the eye, not only the tear form. So how does it work? When you start, you have four options to perform when you're doing the Genvis Pro. Most importantly for me is the fact that they include a screening process. What this does, it allows you to screen every single patient that comes into your practice for a dry eye by doing a non-invasive tear meniscus height measurement, a non-invasive tear breakup time, but also an objective redness grading and a questionnaire which analyzes the symptoms of the patients. Furthermore, if you need to follow up, you can do an uh, extra test, which includes mybography, 
But the beauty of this new Genvis Pro is the inclusion of up to 25 tests for the eye, looking at everything from the tear film, eyelids, conjunctiva. Lastly, it also includes a follow-up procedure where you can monitor certain tests, certain of the problematic areas of the patient's condition, and this can be followed up and monitored to see that your treatment that you prescribe is working for the patients. I mentioned the screening process, and these are the tests that's included in the screening process. What we're analyzing, and I'm sure you will be familiar, is your tear film quantity, the quality, inflammation that's assessed with the redness scan, um, scan, and then also very importantly is the symptoms that the patient is presenting. After you've done the screening process, analysis screen will come up. You can analyze the patient, and if you find problems with certain of these areas, you can go further and do the comprehensive screening, which is the Genvis individual report. What is included in this report is a way to look at the viscosity of the tear film with the tear film dynamic test. We further also look at with interferometry at the lipid layer of the tear film, which can be assessed. New, which we haven't had in the report before, is the um, screening of the eyelids. Here we look for redness, the telling can't say that big word, <laughs> telling detasia of the eyelids, but also the appearance of the openings of the meibomian glands. We look at both the inferior lid, but also the superior lid. We also analyze the lashes or give you the option to look at the lashes for appearance of demodacts or scaling, crusting of the lids. So all of this is done by images taking of the upper, the superior and the inferior lid. Next, we move on to the mybography. We have the options to do both mobography of the lower and the upper lid, and this can then be analyzed and graded according to the Genvis grading scale. There is the upper lid appearance. Furthermore, and as you can see, we started with the least invasive, being the non-invasive tear meniscite, and we're moving towards more invasive. It's very important when you're doing dry eye screening that you start with your least invasive, as you do not want to have tear, um, um, the tear film producing extra tears because you are invading the, uh, 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 the eyes. So after you've done up to my biography, you install fluorescein into the eye and you have the option to take images of the conjunctiva, both temporally and nasally, but also the central corneal staining is analyzed to assess the condition of the eye. Lastly, we have an option where you can take a video recording of the eye with the fluorescein and you assess the blinking rate of the eye of the patient. In some severe dry eye cases, and also some patients who is doing a lot of excessive computer work, they tend to not completely blink when they are blinking. This is something that the patients need to be aware of because they need to close their eyes in order for the tear film to be spread more evenly on the eye. After you've done all of these screening process, the software automatically directs you to the analysis screen. The beauty of this, you can have your operators, your nurses, your technicians do all of the screening processes and you as the doctor then just in the end have to analyze the different tests and see the diag or come up with a diagnosis of the eye. As you can see, all of the different tests will be recorded and will be graded accordingly. Some of the tests like the NICBUT, the RED scan, um, these ones are objectively graded graded and some of the other ones you have to look at the images and grade it accordingly but very importantly we guide you and give you advice in the screen in the software which processes to follow after completion of all of these tests as I mentioned in the beginning you will receive a printout with all the reports or all the results being explained or being showed in a color coded very importantly is the recommendation, your treatment plan for your patient, so that they can go home and they can exactly understand what needs to be done to improve this condition. And lastly, as I mentioned, the explanation of all the screening processes. How do we aid you? Because your time is very important to you. How do we streamline that process? The software is developed to indicate and give you a good guidance through the process, not only just by the camera showing that which way should you be going, but also in the way that we do these tests, that we go systematically from one eye to the other in a process that will save you time. Furthermore, we also give operator instructions for every test that your technician or nurse can know exactly how to perform this test. 
We also have in the screening, screen, uh, screening screens, we have the option to change the magnification or the speed or whether you want to actually do a video recording or an image taken. And last but not least is when you analyze, recommendations are pre-recorded in the software so that when you are analyzing the different factors of these dry eye disease, you can automatically click for different recommendations but also you have the options to additionally add some comments or recommendations to your patients. Furthermore, because we believe it's an all-included dry eye screening report, we have the option that you can add the results from other machines, for example, your inflammation markets, osmolarity tests. All of that results can be input into the report so that when your patient has finished with the dry eye screening, they have everything included in one report and you also that it aids with your diagnosis. So once again, if we look at the prerequisites of both the doctor and the patient, I think this comprehensive dry screening met, meets all the expectations of both parties. But very importantly, after finally diagnosing the patient, is that you are educating them visually. Studies have shown that for the compliance of certain diseases, and dry eye disease being one, very, uh, one of these, it is very important to visually educate your patients to increase their compliance. In the case of dry eye disease, if a patient is not compliant with their treatment, you will not improve this. And I think the keratograph in the Genvis Pro report really aids in this, and this leaves you in the end of the day with patients who's not only happy with your treatment, but happy that their eye condition is improving. So, to sum up, in the end of the day, I think the Genvis Dry Eye Report is the most comprehensive dry eye screening currently available on the market. It's not only aiding in your diagnosis, but it builds trust with your patient because you are showing them what is going on with their eyes. You show them things about their eyes that they've actually never seen before. I'd like to thank you for your time and to listen to me. I appreciate and I wish you a good conference. Thank you.